Hi everyone, welcome back to the processes within the project management body of knowledge. This one in particular we're looking at is defining the scope. Now where does defining scope sit in the overall project management body of knowledge? Well, as you can see, we've been through initiating, identifying our stakeholders, developing our project management plan. We've gathered or collected the requirements from our customers, which is just hidden a little bit there. And now from those requirements, we're defining the scope that we're going to be delivering. So defining the scope is the process of developing a detailed description of the project and the product. And we do this process uh, because it describes the, pro the product service or result boundaries and also the acceptance criteria. So what we're going to be delivering, the scope, and also um, you know, what is the definition of done? How do we know when something can be accepted you know, that it's fit for purpose for our customers? So an overview of defining scope, since all the requirements identified in collect requirements may not be included in the, product, in the project, defining the scope process selects the final project requirements gathered from the collect requirements process. So not all of these will make it into the final, um, final product and as part of our project, and we just need to outline which ones will make it in, which ones will make it out. We then develop a detailed description of the project and the product, the service or the result. Initial risks, scope, constraints from the project charter are updated into our project management plan over time and the define scope process can be highly iterative. In other words, we might start with an idea, usually in the project charter, and we're iterating or adding to that, changing it and improving it over time. Uh, that iterative life cycle, uh, in iterative life cycle projects, a high level vision will be developed upfront which is again uh, representative of our project charter. And then uh, the detailed scope is determined one iteration at a time. So as we get closer to each of the features that we might be develop developing, we look into that in more detail and the activities that we might need to make that happen. Uh, that's also called rolling wave planning, where we've got a high level detail and then just before we're about to work on it, we, uh, we go into much more detail. And then the next feature, much more detail, usually in two to four week uh, iterations in an agile sense. As you can see, there are many uh, inputs into the define scope process, and the define scope process itself will have an input into the project sta scope statement and other project documents. Inputs, tools, and techniques, and outputs for, project, for define scope. The project charter will be an input, the project management plan, Project documents will be an input, and EEFs and OPAs. Expert judgment is a tool and technique that we'll see time and time again. Data analysis, decision making, interpersonal and team skills, and product analysis. Once we've got uh, the solution that we're looking for, and we want to sort of figure out what solution we're going to go with. The project scope statement is an output, and project documents updates we'll have to do as well. So let's look at them in a little bit more detail. Inputs, the project charter is our input, and this provides the project description, project char product characteristics, and approval requirements. So it's that high level view, and now we've gathered the requirements, and now we're delving deeper still into the, the scope, what we're actually going to be delivering we'll have the project management plan. So the scope management plan, which is the way that we're going about collecting and analyzing this scope. So this is the process. Um, this shows us how we're going to do it. And this is why that's an input into defining our scope as well. We'll have project documents like the assumptions log, what assumptions have been made to get to this scope. Uh, the requirements documentation is a big input because we need that to turn that into the, uh, into the scope for the project. And of course, the risk register, what risks are involved? Uh, you know, do we have to change our path or change the product slightly to avoid some risks? Or can we take advantage of some opportunities as well? Enterprise environmental factors might be the existing culture, infrastructure or systems, personnel administration and marketplace conditions that we've seen in other processes also. And organizational process assets and templates, that sort of thing policies, procedures, templates for a project scope statement that are existing in an organization. Um, for example, the project management office or the functional management uh, area might have these particular templates that you can use and take advantage of. Project files from previous projects and lesson learned from previous projects as well. Tools and techniques will also come across expert judgment. 
There's a lot of expert judgment, so a lot of people that will need to be gathering things from and eliciting information from as part of defining our scope. Expertise should be considered from individuals or groups with knowledge or exp experience of similar projects as well. Data analysis, so alternatives. We might have a lot of different uh, alternatives that we will need to analyze. This can be used to evaluate ways to meet the requirements and objectives identified in the charter. So we want to meet those objectives, those high level objectives in the charter. Um, and we might have a few different ways of doing that. So it's time for us to analyze those alternatives. Once we have those alternatives, we will need decision making. So we can use multi-criteria decision making analysis um, and that's where we've got a decision matrix. So we might have a few different criteria on the, on the left here and a few different options um, up the top here and which option meets, uh, meets these criteria. Maybe this one meets all of them, maybe this one meets only a couple and so then we can say we're going to go with product number two or alternative number two. Interpersonal and team skills will definitely be needed to help work with your stakeholders and, uh, and get that information from your stakeholders for the scope and the requirements. And we might need to facilitate meetings in order to do that. So facilitation is used for workshops or working sessions with key stakeholders who have a variety of expectations and fields of expertise. The goal is to reach a cross-functional and common understanding of the project deliverables. So we're gathering that information from them and we also want them to understand what the output is going to be. So we need to relay the outcomes of the, the project scope back to those stakeholders so everyone is on the same page. We can have product analysis as a tool and technique as well. And this is used to define products and services. So what is the product that we're going to be delivering as part uh, to meet those requirements for our customers? It's used for translating high level product or service descriptions into meaningful deliverables. Product analysis techniques can include product breakdown, so maybe a high level idea of the product into smaller ideas so that, we, uh, so that we've got a breakdown into smaller pieces there and activities that we could be delivering. Requirements analysis, systems analysis, what systems might be involved, systems engineering, value analysis, so what value will, be, will we be getting from each different part and which one is, has a higher priority. And then value engineering, how can we engineer more value out of fewer ideas or fewer products. The outputs for defining our scope will be the project scope statement. So the project scope, scope statement is the description of the project scope. And like with everything in our project management plan, it could be just a few lines in your project management plan, or it could be an entire document with diagrams uh, or you know, extra little bits and pieces all to its own. It really is up to you and how you are managing your project and also to the size of the project or the people involved in the project too. These are the enterprise environmental factors that you'll have to work with. The, pro the scope statement facilitates the following. Describing the project deliverables, providing a common understanding for everyone of the project scope, containing explicit scope exclusions. So what is definitely not excluded? That's very important to know. Enabling the project team to perform detailed planning. Uh, on that project scope. So with the work breakdown structure, for example, where we're turning that scope into smaller activities that we actually will be able to complete and work on. And it provides a baseline. So this project scope statement is a baselined document. It's locked in at a certain point in time. And then in order to change it in the future, it will need to go through a change request, which goes to our change control board, if you have one, or to the project sponsor. Um, in order to approve that request and analyze any changes to the cost and schedule that it might make as well. The project scope statement includes the pro product scope description, the deliverables that we've got, the acceptance criteria for those deliverables, and any project exclusions. So we might also have project document updates. We might be updating the assumptions log, the requirements documentation, the requirements traceability matrix. So we've got our requirements on the left with an identifier. And now we're able to match those up to the scope that we're delivering. So now we can fill out more of our requirements traceability matrix. And of course, the stakeholder register. So who are the stakeholders involved and who needs to know what as we're going along on our project? Here's a bit of an example of the project charter versus the project scope statement. As we know, the project charter is a high level document that initiates our project and it has the project purpose, high level requirements, 
overall project risk or high level ideas there, key stakeholders, summary, you know, high level milestones, all those sorts of things. But the project scope statement now has that detail on the project scope description, the deliverables, acceptance criteria, and any exclusions as we saw before. So those are the differences there. Both of those are key documents for your project. And that is the idea behind defining the scope in your project. Thank you.